Welcome to the seminar series on sewer and pipeline engineering. My name is Bert Bossler and I am the scientific director of the IKT Institute for Underground Infrastructure. In this seminar, we will deal with the leak tightness of sewers and pipelines, and in particular, with the informative value of tightness testing. As we know, sewers and pipelines must be tight. If they are not, what flows through the pipeline is no longer cleanly separated from the environment. On the one hand, the conveyed medium can leak out of the pipe, but on the other hand, foreign substances can also get into the pipe. And both of these processes are not welcome. Nobody wants germs in the drinking water, nobody wants sewage in the groundwater, and nobody wants an inflammable air gas mixture underground. In the case of deep-seated sewers that are leaking, groundwater can also enter into the sewers. Sometimes sewers and sewage treatment plants are then flooded with groundwater. For us, the question now is how we can check the tightness of the sewers and pipes. And what about the informative value of these tests? And I would like to discuss this in three steps. First of all, let's take a look at how tightness testing in sewer construction normally works and what criteria have to be fulfilled for a sewer section to pass the test. Then we will think about the probability of a meaningful result. And finally, we will use case studies to discuss how we can assess the extent to which we can trust the test result. After all, results from tightness testing are often the deciding factor for the acceptance of construction measures. Let's start with the tightness testing itself. Here we see a pressure test as it is usually carried out on a sewer section. The section is shut off on both sides from the manhole and then filled with water from the manhole at the lower end. The air escapes at the upper shut-off packer via a venting hose. Finally, the entire pipe is completely filled with water. For the test, the tested section is then put under a defined pressure. For this purpose, a hose is connected to the tested section and to a vessel on the surface. The sewer section is then under the exact pressure of the water column in the hose. Usually the vessel is raised to the top of the ground up to a maximum of 5 meters above the tested section. That would be a maximum of 0.5 bar pressure. The decisive factor is whether the water level in the vessel sinks over time or not. It has been agreed in standards that a slight drop is permissible. The vessel is filled again and again over the test period and the amount of water needed is measured. In the European standard EN 1610, for example, it is regulated by how much the water volume in the test chamber may change at most so that the test is still considered passed. And that is 0.15 liters per square meter of wetted internal surface for a test of about 30 minutes. So what does that mean in concrete terms? Well, if we test, for example, a sewer section of 50 meters in length with a diameter of 30 centimeters, the inner surface area is 50 meters in length times pi times 30 centimeters in diameter. And that is about 50 square meters. For each square meter, 0.15 liters may be added which makes a total of 7.5 liters. Well, that is almost a bucket full of water. This tolerance was introduced because concrete pipes, for example, absorb water into their pores without the pipes leaking. And plastic pipes can expand under internal pressure. Even then, you need to add water to keep the water in the vessel at a constant level. Of course, there is not only the test with water, alternatively, you can also test with air pressure. In this case, the pressure loss over the test time is compared with the tolerance value. However, it is not only the test method and the limit values that are important for assessing the informative value of a test result. In addition, we also need to know what errors can occur during a test. And here we distinguish between two cases false positive and false negative results. In the case of false positives, 
the pipeline failed the test even though it is tight. This means that the leakage has been identified although there is none. In the case of false negative, the pipe passes the test even though it is leaking, so we assume that there are no leaks although there are. Both cases are unpleasant. In the first case, a sewer section is not accepted, even though it is okay. In the second case, everyone is happy with the result, but there is now an undetected risk waiting underground. So, how can such errors occur? Well, there are many causes. A tight sewer section may not pass the test, for example, because the test equipment itself is leaky, or because there is water creep at the shut of packers. There can also be defects in the venting, so that there is still air in the tested section that is compressed. False negative results, on the other hand, are rarer, but still possible. For example, if the shut-off packer itself is sitting on a leak, the leak will not be detected. If the groundwater level is high, the groundwater can also generate so much counter-pressure that the pipe does not lose any water during the test. This would also be a false negative. So we see there are many possible test failures. And we now have to ask ourselves, how likely is it that we can really trust our test results? And this is what I would now like to address in principle. How likely is it that our test result is correct? Can we calculate something like that, or at least estimate it for practice? Yes, it can be calculated. After all, there are clever mathematicians. You surely know Thomas Bayes' famous theorem about conditional probabilities. This theorem also helps us here. We can use it to answer the following question, for example. What is the forecast? or predictive value of the test result not passed. Of course, this also works for the case passed, but not passed costs real money in practice and that is why we want to take a closer look at this example. Here we see the equation and also everything we need to know, or at least estimate so that we can calculate the whole thing. We can calculate if we know three things. First, the probability that the sewer or pipeline tested is tight. Secondly, the probability that the sewer or pipeline tested is not tight. And then number three, the probability that the sewer or pipeline does not pass the test. For mathematicians, this solves the problem and everyone is satisfied, at least the mathematicians. However, for all non-mathematicians, I have added a third point to my presentation. That is, a case study that helps us to better understand how we deal with this in practice. And here comes the first example. Imagine the following situation. The tester hands you the test result leaking for a pipeline. You now want to assess in your gut how far you can trust this test result. In doing so, you think about the following. First, the test circumstances are not that simple. Everything is narrow, inserting a shut-off packer can sometimes go wrong, and the tester doesn't look very patient or careful either, and who knows how the venting worked out. But with a little goodwill, 90% of the tight sewers and pipelines will probably pass the test. That's your first guess. The other way around, you are more confident. If a leaky pipe passes the test, then the shut-off packer must really be sitting on a leak and that is very rare. So you estimate 99% of the non-tight sewers or pipelines will not pass the test. 90% and 99%, by the way, that are values that we were able to confirm, for example, in our research projects for the area of property drainage with well-trained testers using perfect equipment. The third value is not about the quality of testing, but about the quality of construction. You assume that every 10th sewer section is not in proper condition. In other words, every 10th sewer in the system is leaking. That means it is non-tight. 
So that is our example where we have estimated both the values for the testing quality and for the construction quality. And now comes the crucial question. What is the probability that if the test is not passed, the tested line is actually leaking? After all, we only want to rehabilitate really defective sewer sections. For the results, I give you a few suggestions. Is it only 52.4% or is it 89.1%, 90% or even 99%? Or do you say 100%? Or are you leaning towards solution F and would rather end the seminar series today? Just stop the video and think about the possible solutions. Have you decided? Well, the correct solution is A, 52.4%. So actually 50-50, that means that in this case, half of all failed tests are actually tied sewers. And of course, that sounds unacceptable. But how can that be? How can it be explained? Well, mathematically, this is easy to explain. We use Bayes' theorem and we can directly determine the forecast value from the individual probabilities. 52.4% in this case. This seems easy, but it hardly helps to understand why the result is like that. Therefore, I want to clarify the whole thing with the help of concrete numbers. Let's assume we have 1000 pipelines that our tester has checked in total. We have assumed that every 10th pipeline is really leaking. That means that 100 of the 1,000 sewer sections are actually not tied and 900 are actually tied. Now, all these sewers are tested. Let's start with the sewers that actually leak. Well, we have estimated that 99% of all leaking sewers do not pass the test. However, one time we make a mistake. For example, we put the shutoff packer on the leak and the test is mistakenly passed after all. How does it look with the other, the tight sewer sections? Well, 90% pass the test. So 810 times the test result is passed and that is also correct. But we also make many mistakes. In 10% of the cases, that means 90 times, the test is not passed. The result then falsely says non-tied. Now comes the crucial point. Let's take a look at how many sewers failed the test altogether. There are 99 lines that correctly failed the test and 90 lines that falsely failed. In total, that is 189 cases in which the test was not passed. But of those tests, only 99 were actually non-tied. In other words, the prediction non-tied was only true in 99 out of 189 cases in our example. To put it in another way, the prediction value is about 52.5%. This is, of course, extremely unsatisfactory. But what is the reason for this? Well, the reason is actually due to a very simple fact. The phenomenon we are looking for with the test is just as common as our test error. Here this means that the construction quality is just as good as the testing quality. Or the other way around, the testing errors are just as frequent as the construction errors. Every tenth sewer leaks, but every tenth test on a tight pipe also fails. If a test is not passed, it may be due to a leaky pipe, but it may just as well be due to a testing error. Both are equally likely, which is why the informative value of a failed test certificate is so low in this case. Now, however, we have said that the test quality with 99% or 90% correct tests is quite common in the practice of property drainage. Is this situation then a disaster or is it perhaps acceptable after all? The surprising answer is, it is acceptable for all cases where already existing lateral connections and sewer systems have been tested. And that is because the construction quality is much worse there. There, in existing structures, 
it is not only every 10th connection line that is leaking, but far more. 80% of all already existing lateral sewers are probably not tied. And that has huge consequences for our calculation. Once again, 99% of the leaking sewers fail the test. This time there are 792 cases. Of the actually leaky sewers, 10% fail, but this time it is only 20 sewers because there are only much fewer tight ones. When we now calculate our forecast value, the picture is completely different from the first time. 97.5% of the pipes with the result not passed are really and actually leaking. And this is precisely because the 80% poor construction quality is almost an order of magnitude greater than the 10% test error. Now you may be asking yourself, that's all well and good, but we can't force the construction quality to deteriorate just so that our testing is accurate enough. That is of course true. The other option is to improve the reliability of the test to such an extent that it is significantly better than the construction quality. If, as in the first example, we have only 10% construction errors, then the test must make only 1 or 2% errors, that means be 99% reliable. And we now see this case in this graph. The test quality has been consistently improved to 99%. The construction quality is still at 90%, so every tenth sewer or pipeline is leaking again. Now, 99 of the leaky pipes fail the test, and only 9 of the tight pipes do not pass. So in total, 108 fail the test, but 99 of them are correctly classified as non-tight. 91.7% of the not passed tests therefore took place on lines that were actually non-tied. This is far more acceptable than our initial example, where the rate was only about 52%. So we see, tightness tests of sewers and pipelines can be carried out, for example with water or air as the test medium. As a rule, there are tolerance values for water additions and pressure losses, up to which a test is considered to have passed. All tests can have test errors. In the case of false positive results, leaks are apparently detected, although the pipe is tight. And in the case of false negative results, the test is passed, even though the pipe is actually leaking. For practical purposes, one should be aware of the probability of test errors. As a rule, we remember the quality of the test must always be an order of magnitude better than the construction quality we want to check. If this is not the case, then we get just as many test errors as there are actual defects on the sewers and pipelines, and the informative value of a not passed result is too low. By the way, these correlations have long been a big issue in medicine as well. There, however, test errors are often a matter of life and death. Here, in sewer and pipeline engineering, it is usually only a question of the acceptance of the construction and the possible costs of rehabilitation. But this also requires a high sense of responsibility and knowledge about test errors and their effects. Thank you.